So now that we've talked about supply curves and demand curves and elasticity, we need to talk about um, taxes and how taxes are related to all of these other concepts we've talked about. And this is important because this is why you're in this program. Like this is the whole point of public policy and public administration is to think about taxes and to think about the burdens that taxes put on people and how they distort markets and how to trade off the distortions with the benefits you get from tax revenue and what you can do with that as a local government. Um, and so we care about this stuff, especially in policy and administration. Um, so to talk about this, though, we need to talk about a couple more concepts. Um, we need to talk about this idea of surplus. Um, we've mentioned this already when we talked about the um, playing card game where you had to go out and, and find and buy a paperclip for a specific price that was based on um, your budget or your willingness to sell. Um, the people making those trades got bonus points. So if you had a card that was 10, for instance, your budget was 10, and you were able to get a price of five for a paperclip, you got five bonus points. Um, and that was great for you. You like that because you were willing to pay up to 10, but you only had to pay five. And so what we call that, that bonus points that you get is called surplus. Um, so consumer surplus is from the buyer side. It's the difference between your willingness to pay and the price that you paid. So if you're willing to buy a book for $10, but the actual price for the book is $5, you get $5 of surplus. And that's just kind of good deal points that you get. Um, it's how good of a deal the consumer gets. You also have this thing called producer surplus, which is the difference between the willingness to sell or the willingness to accept and the price. So if the seller is willing to pay, willing to sell something for $2, they're willing to go down that low, but they can sell it for six, for instance, then they're gonna get four points of surplus. That's $4 of surplus, that's a good deal. And so again, it's, it's this good deal points is what we're measuring with surplus. Um, the way you see this graphically, if we look at the supply and demand curve, we already saw like, I think it was 24 books and $8 is uh, what we see here. What you can do is if you draw a straight line from where the price is out to here, this whole triangle here is the consumer surplus, the total consumer surplus that exists out in the world. And the triangle down below is the producer surplus. So what this means is that in this market, there are some people who are willing to pay $20 for a book. They only have to pay eight. And so that means they have $12 of surplus. And you can actually measure that from here down to there. That's going to be $12. Okay, there are also people who are willing to pay uh, $12 for a book, for instance, and they only have to pay eight. And so that distance there is gonna be like four. So they get $4 of benefit, like of bonus points, because they didn't have to pay that much. There are also gonna be people who are willing to pay $8.50, and they only have to pay eight, and that's great. They get 50 cents of surplus, and that's great for them. So this whole triangle here is consumer surplus. And you can actually calculate this mathematically um, using geometry. So if you remember, um, there's from your geometry days, whenever you took that in middle school, um, the area of a triangle is one half base times height. So we could actually calculate this by figuring out the base of the triangle. So it goes from zero to 24. Um, the height of the triangle goes from eight to 20. So zero to 24 is 24. The height of the triangle goes from 8 to 20, so that is 12. So if we say 1 half 12 times 24, that is the area of that triangle, and that's going to be the whole consumer surplus for all consumers in the market. So 1 half times 24 is 12. So 12 times 12 is 144 equals, wow, 144, we'll do the 44 first. Writing this on a trackpad, so 144. So that is the total consumer surplus. It's something that you can actually calculate. You'll calculate the stuff in your problem sets as well. Um, it's an actual number. This is just the total bonus points that people get, that all of society gets as consumers. You can also do the same thing for producers here. And you can see how much of general good points the the producers are getting from selling stuff at eight dollars a book um, 
And so you can add this up. You can also figure out the same um, area of a triangle here and figure out 1 half base times height. It's going to be less than 144, um, but you can still figure out that amount. So that's what surplus is. Um, it's kind of the good deal points that you get either as a buyer or a seller, and you can actually add it up. It's just these shaded regions in this supply and demand graph. But that surplus can change as prices change. And one thing that causes prices to change is taxation. When you tax something, it actually raises the price. Or when you subsidize something, it actually lowers the price. And so you can mess with prices as a government. So governments have a few reasons why they would tax something. Um, often governments tax so they can raise revenue for services. Um, you, um, public schools in the United States are funded by um, property taxes for whatever reason, um, which leads to all sorts of downstream effects um, and hurts um, equality. It leads to all sorts of inequality because poor neighborhoods with lower property values get fewer property tax revenues, which then leads to worse schools, and it, it causes all sorts of issues. Um, but that, in general, governments tax things so that they can raise revenues, so that you can provide public goods and other things. Um, governments also tax so that they can redistribute resources. Um, so they can fund things like um, Medicare and Medicaid, so they can fund things like the Earned Income Tax Credit, um, and SNAP benefits and um, WIC and other like welfare services, um, those all exist so that you can move resources and money from richer people to poorer people. And so that's another purpose for taxes. Um, and then finally, governments can tax to either encourage or discourage consumption. So we've talked about this a few times. If, if you have a sin tax where you want to um, discourage the consumption of cigarettes, for instance, you're going to impose taxes on cigarettes so that the price goes up, so that the quantity goes down, so few, fewer people actually buy it. Um, and so that's another reason to tax. That doesn't lead to consistent revenues because um, eventually people are going to stop buying the thing and then you won't get the revenue from it. Um, but that's not the point of this kind of tax. The point of this kind of tax is to change consumption. It's not trying to raise revenue here. Um, and so when governments tax, um, if they're trying to raise revenue for public goods, then they're going to raise revenue for public goods, and that's good. Um, they'll also redistribute resources, which is their goal. But another side effect is this idea here, that you have distortion in a market, or you have a loss of efficiency. And this is where lots of like, free market advocates that say government should not be involved at all in a market, um, mathematically, there's a reason why they have that argument. Because it messes up um, the good deal points that you can get, and it prices people out of markets. If somebody was willing to pay something, um, for a book, but now taxes make it more expensive, they're not going to be able to get that book. And so it can mess up markets and distort things. So we can look at this distortion graphically. So here's um, back to our original supply and demand here. Books, um, there are 24 books being sold for $8 here. Um, there's lots of consumer surplus. There's some producer surplus. Everybody's happy. Um, the government decides to impose a tax of $5 on every book. What that will do is it will raise the supply line from um, down here having an intercept at um, two to having an intercept at seven. So it's going up by five here. The slope is the same, um, but it moves that whole curve up or that whole line up. And so now the price used to be um, $8 for 24 books. The new price is now like $12 for like 18 books. So there's going to be fewer books sold, and they're going to be more expensive. What that means practically is if you were one of these people here where you're willing to spend like $15 for a book, and you were paying eight, you got lots of good deal points. That was good. You were fine with that. Now you're willing to spend $15, and it's now $12. You're still going to buy the thing. You're still getting good deal points, but not lots of good deal points. Um, you have fewer good deal points. You have less surplus, but you still have some surplus. But if you're in this world here, where you're willing to spend $10 for a book, and you only had to spend eight, that's great for you. You're getting $2 in bonus points. Um, that's your good deal point. You have surplus. That's great. But now that the price has gone up to $12, you can't buy books anymore. You're out of that market. And that stinks for you because you can no longer access the books that you were willing to buy. 
um, and so you lose and companies can't sell to you anymore and you can't buy stuff anymore, which means there's a loss of efficiency. The market is not reaching as many people as it could. So graphically, we can do the same type of triangle situation here. So the new price here is right there. Um, so we still have consumer surplus, which if we go from the price all the way to the y-axis, we have our triangle here. So that's the total good deal points that society gets from this new price. But notice how the producer surplus is no longer starting here. That's because they have to sell the thing. Like because of the taxes here, they're bearing that extra $5. And so they can no longer, like they're selling at this price, but they're not bringing in that money anymore because of the taxes. So they're going to be down at this point. So their surplus actually goes from this point over to the y-axis and down. So their producer surplus is smaller now, as is the consumer surplus. We lost a whole bunch of consumer surplus. We lost this whole chunk right here. That wedge right there is gone, okay? So here's our consumer surplus. It's still big, but smaller. Here's our producer surplus. It's smaller. The government actually gets money. The whole point of raising taxes is that money goes to the government. And the money that goes to the government is this rectangle here. This yellow rectangle here is all of the money that the government gets. And we can actually calculate the, the actual amount that they get here based on this graph um, if we calculate the area of the rectangle, um, which again, if we go back to geometry, we can figure that out. It's the length times the width. So the length goes from 0 to 18-ish, and the height is from seven ish to 12. So the height is five. So it's five times 18, whatever that is, a um, little bit less than 100, 90 maybe, I don't know. Um, that's going to be the amount of money that the government takes in. Um, so that's, that's the total tax revenue that they get is this rectangle here. That is actually split between the producers and the consumers. The producers are going to pay some of that, and the producers or the consumers are going to pay some of that. And you can actually tell based on where the original price was. If you draw a line straight out to here, um, this slice of the rectangle is the tax burden borne by the producers. And the tax burden up here is the part that is borne by the consumers. So in this instance, um, you can see that the consumers are actually spent, or they're actually paying more of the burden, um, bearing more of the burden of this tax. Even though the producers have to raise their price, um, they're the ones charging higher amounts, but more people are getting priced out. If you were willing to spend like $11.50 on a book, and now you can't because the price is 12, that stinks for you. And so the, like, what ends up happening is the consumers in this situation, based on how these lines are sloped, um, consumers are bearing more of the burden. So the last part of this, this graph here is this triangle right here. This is called the dead weight loss. It is the part of the economy that nobody gets. The government doesn't get any of that value. Um, the producers don't get any of that value and the consumers don't get any of that value. These are the people who would be willing to spend $10 for a book, but can't anymore. So that means they're not buying books, which means they're not paying taxes on those books. So the government doesn't get those taxes. And it means the sellers aren't selling to them and they're not bringing in revenues. And so this is basically how much damage there is to the economy because of the tax. So you can figure out, again, using geometry, you can figure out the area of this triangle. If you do one half base times height, you can figure out how much economic damage or the impact of this tax is on the market. Um, and so nobody's getting anything because of that dead weight loss. And so we don't like dead weight loss. Um, as economists or as somebody who's caring about taxes, you generally don't want to create huge inefficiencies in the market. The bigger the dead weight loss is, the more inefficiency there is. And that means fewer people are, are able to buy stuff and to, are able to participate in the market. So we don't want dead weight loss. Okay. Um, that incidence and the amount of dead weight loss that you get is actually directly related to elasticity, which is why we talked about elasticity again in this section here. Um, the incidence depends on how elastic people are, which makes sense because if you remember, we said that if, if you're highly elastic, 
and the price changes, you're just gonna move away and buy something else. And so if books start getting more expensive and you're highly elastic, you're gonna just go buy movies or video games or do something else instead of books. Um, so you're very responsive to changes in price. So if you're a consumer and you're highly elastic, you're not gonna pay much of the tax. You're not gonna bear the burden. The tax burden falls on those who are least able to escape it. So those who are most inelastic, they have to bear more of the burden of the tax. They pay more. Um, and so for instance, if the government decides to double its taxes on EpiPens, um, that's going to fall, like that extra burden is gonna fall on the people who rely on EpiPens. Um, they're not gonna be able to substitute away to some other product because they have to rely on that, on that crucial medicine. And so they're going to be bearing the burden of, of, the, of that tax. Um, if you tax a producer who is very inelastic, um, they're going to have to bear most of the burden of it and consumers will just go away and buy something else. So ultimately, the burden that, like the, the tax burden, the amount of this, um, like the size of these different rectangles here is directly related to the elasticity. So if you see here, the consumer tax burden here is bigger than the producer tax burden. So just looking at that, you can say that consumers are fairly um, inelastic and producers are fairly elastic. They can get rid of stuff um, fairly quickly. They can switch away to something else. Um, they can get away from the tax while consumers can't. Um, and so they have to bear more of the burden of the tax. Um, so a few examples of this, we won't walk through all of the math. Um, these are actual equations um, on the course website and the resources page. I walk through all of the calculations for this and how to graph this. You can also just plug these into Desmos um, and, and see the same lines there. So in this situation, this is a, a good example of demand that is very, very elastic. Um, and so what that means is if the prices start changing, people are going to jump away from that product. Um, and that means the consumers aren't going to pay a lot of the tax burden. They have a very small sliver of that tax burden. Producers are going to bear most of the burden there. But this is also really bad because look how much deadweight loss there is. There are a ton of people in the society that won't be able to access um, the goods because the price is too expensive. Um, and so that is wildly inefficient um, and that is bad. Like you don't want to do that. There are tons of people who can't buy stuff. Um, the government is foregoing all of that revenue. Like none of that revenue exists anymore. It's all been swallowed up into this dead weight loss. Um, inelastic demand. This is um, where the consumers are going to spend more on taxes. They're going to bear more of the burden here. Um, and the producers are able to escape and maybe switch to a different product or do something so they can escape the tax. Um, and so you can see that just because of the different slopes of these lines and where the, inter where the intersections are, if you remember, um, like again, like the early lines here are the more elastic sections here. Um, and then the, the later part of the line are inelastic. And so um, just based on these, these slopes here, you can see that consumers are bearing more of the burden, which means they can't escape it, which means they're more inelastic. Um, we can do the same thing from the supply side. If you have elastic supply, um, that means the suppliers are able to escape the tax. And so their tax burden is very small and consumers are gonna bear most of that burden. Um, if you have inelastic supply, um, that means the producers are gonna bear most of the burden and consumers can switch away and they can buy other stuff instead. Um, in these situations, there's different sizes of deadweight loss or the loss of efficiency in the market. There's different ways of calculating that just with the, the different slopes of the lines and you do the area equals one half base times height. And um, there's examples of how to do that in the resources page. Um, but that's basically what you do. When you see these supply and demand curves and you see that one of them moves up because of taxes or moves down because of subsidies, um, you can shade in the different triangles and rectangles and you can use geometry to calculate the areas of those triangles and rectangles and you can figure out um, the exact tax revenues and the exact uh, consumer and producer surplus and the exact dead weight loss based on um, these market dynamics here. Um, so a couple of different things with this consumer. When, when consumers face taxes, there's two different ways um, to give um, taxes to consumers. There's this idea of progressive taxes, um, which is one way of, of levying taxes on people. With progressive taxes, the rich pay more. 
Um, and one example of this is income taxes. Um, we've talked about this before when we talked about the veil of ignorance um, simulation that we do in person if we, if we were doing this class in person, um, where the way the tax system works in the United States is um, you pay higher taxes as you move up to higher tax brackets. And so if you only earn up to like $10,000 or some amount, you actually pay no taxes. And then you pay a smaller amount on the next chunk of income, and then you pay a bigger amount on the next chunk of income, and you keep moving up, um, your marginal tax rate increases as you get more and more income. And the reason we have that is because we have this idea of progressive taxation where we believe that rich people should pay more um, in taxes. Um, there are loopholes to get around that. Um, that's why we have like offshore um, corporations and all sorts of other ways to, to avoid taxes. But in general, like income taxes are designed to be progressive. You also have this idea of regressive taxes, where this makes it so poor people pay more um, relative to their income. And sales taxes and payroll taxes are actually a good example of this. Um, so if you think about like an, in a super extreme case, if you are Bill Gates and you go to the store and you buy $100 worth of stuff and you have to pay sales tax on it of like 7%, you pay $7 in taxes on, on your food. Um, that $7 in proportion to his income and his assets is tiny. It's microscopic. It doesn't make a dent at all in his um, total assets. And so that sales tax doesn't really affect him at all. Um, but if you imagine that you, as a student, have $100 left or have $200 left in your checking account and you go shopping and spend $100 and you have to pay $7 in taxes, that $7 in proportion to your total income or your total assets left in your checking account, that is a huge chunk. Like seven, That's like a big chunk of your, your total assets there. And so the taxes actually hurt you more. You're, you bear more of the burden of the taxes. Um, just because of, of how the tax structure is set up. Payroll taxes do the same thing. Um, if you earn a ton of money, like $500,000 a year or whatever, and you have um, some payroll tax amount on that, um, proportionally, that's, it's going to be the same percent. It's going to be like 10% or something. But that's not going to be as big of a hit on you as it would be if you were just earning like $5,000 a year. 10% of that, that's going to be a huge chunk of your annual income there. And so it's going to hurt the poor more. Um, flat taxes. Flat taxes are a popular um, policy proposal just to make tax um, the tax system easier, um, where we just say everybody pays 15% in taxes. Um, while that is easy, it is on the regressive side of things. Because again, if you're Bill Gates paying 15% of your income is a tiny sliver of your total assets and income and it's not going to hurt as much as somebody earning just $10,000 a year paying 10% on that, that's a big chunk of their income. And so it, it falls more on, like the burden of that tax falls more on, poor, uh, on the poor than on the rich. Um, and so that's kind of the difference between these, these two different forms of taxation. And the incidence falls on different consumers, again, based on elasticity and based on assets and um, kind of who can escape the tax and, and how big it is proportional to your income and your assets. So when you think about this idea of, of taxation and whether or not a tax should be regressive or uh, progressive, um, you need to think about the idea of fairness. And we've, we've given you some, some different standards of fairness, like procedural fairness and, and other things. Um, with taxation, there's a couple other principles that we can apply when we're thinking about fairness. One is this idea of the benefits principle. Um, this argument is that the people who benefit from public spending should bear the burden of the tax. Um, and so this is a guiding principle for lots of different taxation systems. Um, for instance, if you own a car and you buy gas for the car, there are gas taxes that help um, pave roads and are used for the road system. And that is designed according to this benefits principle. So that the people who use gas and who use cars are paying taxes to support that. If you don't have a car and you don't buy gas, you are not paying taxes to support the public road system um, because you're not using the public road system. And so again, this is based on this, this benefits principle, those who drive more pay more. 
Um, and so that's kind of a, a classic example of this benefits principle in real life. But it's not typically used as um, a normal justification for taxation, um, in part because when you get into things like Medicare and Medicaid, if we apply the benefits principle there, um, that starts getting kind of iffy, where the people who benefit the most from Medicaid are the poorest. And so we don't want to make the poorest pay for um, their benefits because they can't. Um, that's the whole reason we have Medicaid and WIC and other systems. Um, and so if we only apply the benefits principle, if we apply the benefits principle universally, that's going to make it so that the programs that help the poor aren't actually accessible by the poor because um, it, they're going to be underfunded. So another principle you can use is this ability to pay principle, um, which is this idea that the people with a greater ability to pay a tax should pay more tax. Um, and this is what we see um, with progressive taxation, for instance. Um, people who can afford to kind of give up more of their income in taxation are generally required to do so with income taxes with the different brackets that's designed so that as you get richer you start paying more to the government for um, your increased income and if you're poor you actually pay less to the government because of that um, which is based on this ability to pay principle so these are two different two different ways of looking at the 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 fairness built into taxes um, and it's a good thing to consider when you're when you're thinking about how to tax and whether or not a tax is fair um, now you have new vocabulary to to use when you're talking about it um, which makes it more convincing instead of just saying that this feels unfair you can say this regressive tax feels unfair because it goes against the ability to pay principle or this progressive progressive tax feels more fair because it helps with the ability to pay principle um, or other things. You can now you now have a, a better language for discussing these types of policy issues.